follows. In the, uh, in the first part, I will recall some classical quantity, which is called alpha invariant. And uh, I will start with the analytic, analytic definition of Tian, and uh, I will also focus on his pontized approach. And also I will give several algebraic definitions for this alpha invariant. Then in the second part, I will talk about a relatively new invariant that was introduced by Fuji, Fujita and Odaka, which is called the delta invariant. And I will give several applications of this delta invariant. Then the third part of this talk will focus on some of my recent joint work with Tian and Rubinstein. Um, basically, we developed a quantized theory for this uh, delta environment. We relate this delta environment to the um, most Schrodinger inequality. Uh, more precisely, we consider some quantized spin functional, and we show we can show that this coercivity of the spin functional is characterized by this quantized delta environment, which is also related to balanced metric in the literature. And uh, in the final part, I will probably discuss some uh, extensions of our results to various settings. For instance, we can consider soliton metrics and uh, coupled metrics or things like that. So let's start. Um, the motivation of our study is this uh, Einstein problem. So in this talk, I will, for simplicity, fix a smooth n-dimensional final manifold, which means that the anti-canonical line bundle is the ample line bundle. Then the fundamental question is whether we can find some Keller form in the first Chern class such that it satisfies this Keller-Einstein equation. Um, there are several ways to study this problem. Um, there are two classical ways. The first is the continuity method. You can run this uh, continue the method and you can try to find the solution of this equation when t is equal to one. And then this will give you a Klein-Stein metric. And also you can use the Killerich flow, which is like this, and you can try to study the limit as t goes to infinity. And uh, more um, now in, in like uh, in recent study, this variational approach is more uh, popular, I can say. Uh, you can use like a beam energy or K energy to study this k Einstein problem. Basically, you can try to find the critical point of these functionals and, uh, and you can study the properties of the metrics using these functionals. And also um, there's an algebraic geometry approach. Uh, one can use some uh, stability threshold, for instance, the alpha and delta invariants that I will talk about in this talk. And uh, there are some other approach called non kimedian approach, which uses uh, more uh, valuative language to study this uh, K-Langstein problem. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on the last two points. Basically, I will try to relate this variational approach to this algebraic geometric approach uh, in terms of these uh, stability thresholds. Um, so let me first recall the original definition of alpha invariant of Tian. And first of all, you fix a uh, background of Taylor metric, and then you consider this space of Taylor potential. Then, um, in 1987, Tian introduced the following notion. And he considers all the Taylor potentials and he considers such an integral. He wants to, this integral to be finite for every uh, Taylor potential. And uh, this definition does not depend on the choice of uh, the background metric. And uh, this uh, invariant is quite useful because it is the first effective criterion for the existence of the Kerlinson metrics. So one has the following theorem of Tian, which says that when the alpha invariant of the final manifold is bigger than n over n plus one, then X must admit a Kerlinson metric. Uh, I should remark that uh, the recent work of uh, Odaka Sano and uh, Li Tian Wang and Li implied that this result also holds for 
singular Q final variety. Okay. Now, uh, to study such uh, uh, invariant, uh, Tian proposed a quantization approach. Basically, you can consider uh, the following Bergman space. Uh, one can, uh, the, the rough idea is like you, one can approximate everything using Fubini student metrics. So more precisely, you can consider this vector space for large M and uh, you can take any basis from this space, then this will induce an, an embedding of your manifold into the projective space. Then you can restrict the Fubini student metric in the projective space to the embedded manifold, then this will give you a family of uh, metrics when you change the basis. So this uh, space is called the space of Bergman potential. And uh, the fundamental result is the following. It says that any Hiller potential can be approximated by a sequence of uh, Bergman potential in a, super, in a super total sense. Um, so in using this result, one can cook up the following uh, definition of uh, alpha invariant. Uh, this was introduced by Tian in his thesis, which uh, measures this uh, integrability condition on the subspace. He considers all the phi in this uh, Bergman space and he cook up such an invariant. And uh, Tian conjecture that this invariant should converge to his um, alpha invariant defined uh, earlier. And uh, this conjecture was uh, proved in 2007 by the Mai and also probably independently by Yalong Shi in his thesis. And uh, we will give more, more details of, of this uh, later. And uh, the, the key point is that in their proof, they show that this alpha invariant measures the worst singularity in the anti-canonical linear system. So what do I mean by singularity? And uh, in this talk, the singularity will be measured in terms of this log canonical threshold. Um, since this is a complex geometry seminar, I will try to make things complex. So uh, when you have a divisor on the manifold, you, you can locally consider it as a zero locus of some holomorphic function. So let's say D is locally given by uh, this vanishing order, or a vanishing locus of uh, some holomorphic function, then LCT of D is defined to be uh, the inf of this CPF. What's this CPF? It's just uh, some uh, integrability threshold defined in this way. So this quantity is called the complex singularity exponent in complex geometry. And it measures the singularity of this holomorphic function around the point P using this L2 integrability so uh, if you uh, try, if you want to work globally, then you can choose any Hermitian metric. And uh, then this LCT is defined using this integral condition. Yeah. So uh, this is the definition of LCT. And then you can try to define this uh, uh, algebraic alpha M invariant. Uh, you can write it as LCTM, which is defined this way. You consider all the effective divisors in this linear system and you consider their LCT and uh, then you, you suitably normalize the, this quantity and then you take the incident. And basically this quantity is uh, measuring the worst singularity of divisors in this uh, linear system. Um, then one can apply a result of the Maillet and Collar, which is the lower semi-continuity of complex singularity exponents. Then we can show that this algebraic quantity is equal to the original analytic definition of Tian. And if you try to work uh, globally, then you, again, you can choose some smooth metric. And then this, this equality just shows that um, the analytically defined alpha invariant is uh, can be characterized in this way. You just consider all the non-zero sections and you consider this 
quantity. You want to measure this integrability using some exponent lambda. You want to find some best exponent to make all such quantities finite. Okay, so uh, this is some historical results. And then um, one can use uh, more algebraic notions to study these invariants. So here I briefly record the definition of valuation. This is uh, somehow uh, more related to this non-comedian geometry in the literature. Um, again, recall that this uh, valuation space can be defined in the following way. You, you consider, let's say, any normal projective variety over C, and you consider its function field. Then a valuation is just a map from the function field to the uh, R plus infinity, and it satisfies the following equation, the, the following condition. Then given such a valuation uh, by some results in algebra geometry, one can show that there is a unique skin point in the variety such that it satisfies some local conditions. Then this could see is called the center of evaluation. Um, when you study valuation, there's uh, a special kind of valuation that uh, will be more uh, uh, manageable. These are called divisorial valuations. In, in some suitable topology, divisorial valuations are dense in the space of all valuations. So here, uh, the, uh, the, the setup is as follows. You consider any birational model over X, and you take any prime divisor in this space, then uh, any valuation of such form is called divisorial valuation. And uh, given such uh, a divisor, you can consider its log discrepancy, which is defined in this way. And uh, then um, now given any divisor, effective divisor on your base manifold, then you can make sense of this order of vanishing by pulling back everything to Y. Then you measure the vanishing order along the generic point of F. Uh, this will uh, give you some quantity or the order of the vanishing. Then using such notions, you can rewrite this LCT in a valuative way. So in some sense, this is somehow like a duality. When you uh, measure this LCT, you are measuring its integrability, but uh, somehow you can uh, transform the problem to some evaluative uh, setting. So this quantity here uh, is uh, uh, very useful when we uh, apply tools from birational geometry. And uh, this formulation is uh, uh, the, the same as the previous formulation if you use some resolution of singularity, but I will not go into that direction. Okay, now, so using such notions, you can make sense of uh, the order of vanishing for sections in a linear system. So let's say we have a section of uh, some line bundle, then you can consider the divisor cut out by this section, then you can measure its vanishing order along this divisor over X. And then you, uh, you can consider all such sections, then you can take the, the maximal vanishing order. This will give you this uh, uh, pseudo effective threshold for your uh, linear system. And uh, if you use such notation, you can show that this alpha M environment can be defined in this uh, valuative way. And this definition, again, is quite useful when you want to apply some uh, algebraic tools to study this invariant. And uh, further remarks uh, is that uh, we, we notice we notice that this um, pseudo effective threshold satisfies this uh, uh, additive inequality. Then you can take the limit of uh, this normalized threshold and this limit is called the pseudo effective threshold of L with respect to F. Um, then uh, a result of the Mai and also the that says that uh, the alpha environment of Tn coincides with this uh, valuative formulation. 
basically it said that uh, you consider all multiples of your line bundle and you consider all the divisors in the linear system of these multiples, then you measure how bad the singularity can be in all these linear systems. And uh, this is the um, story for alpha invariant. But now uh, let's go to this uh, delta invariant. Um, this was introduced by Fujita and Odaka in 2016. And uh, the definition is as follows. Uh, you, again, you consider this uh, vector space and then you take a basis, let's say S1 to Sdn. Then each, each section Si cut out a divisor. Then you sum up all these divisors and you normalize these divisors. So you cook up some Q divisor, effective Q divisor, which is Q linearly equivalent to your line bundle. I should mention that uh, in this talk, uh, I, I will mainly focus on the anti-canonical line bundle, but uh, most constructions also works for, for any ample or big line bundle. Um, yeah. Now, any divisor obtained in this way is called uh, an M basis divisor. So, so this is uh, somehow different from the definition of alpha invariant. Alpha invariant just says that you just take any section from this uh, vector space and you measure its LCD. But delta invariant is in some sense um, an, an average of singularity. So, so you consider all these basis type divisors and you take the LCT and uh, you take the infinite. Um, then you uh, cook up the limit uh, using the, this sequence of uh, invariants as m go to infinity. By the work of uh, Broom Johnson, uh, this limit, this limit soup is in fact uh, a, a genuine limit. And uh, roughly speaking, this delta invariant is the expectation of uh, anti-canonical singularity. Um, but the now, uh, you, you can say that this definition uh, uh, is more complicated than the definition of alpha because um, for alpha invariant, uh, um, there is one thing uh, uh, that you can use that when you take like uh, you take a sequence of sections, let's say in uh, a sequence of uh, no, uh, L2 normalized sections, then you can take a, take a limit or whatever. You can take a you can extract a limit from a sequence of sections. But now here, uh, when you consider a basis, the thing is, uh, uh, so let's say when you have a sequence of bases. Uh, from this vector space. The thing is when you try to extract some limit, uh, the limit might not be a basis. So this in some sense makes this um, delta invariant more difficult to study. So in, in, in particular, if you want to compute this invariant, uh, let's say for CPN, the simplest example, if you want to compute uh, the delta M invariant for CPN, Using this definition, it turns out this is a very uh, non-trivial problem. In low dimensions, this was uh, solved by Park Wong using Newton polygons. But for higher dimensions, it's uh, it's a very difficult problem. I can uh, I guess uh, so. So basically, we need to find some other ways to characterize this invariant. Uh, there's one way to uh, uh, to do it, which is using the language of uh, complex geometry. So this is uh, easy. You, you, just, you just take any basis of your vector space and you take the product uh, of these sections using some uh, chosen Hermitian norm and then you consider this integral. So this is just a very easy translation of this, uh, the previous definition, because the previous definition uses the language of LCT, then which can be translated into this integral integrability. Okay, 
but uh, this is not uh, enough. Uh, basically, this is not doing anything. Uh, uh, a more useful way to characterize this uh, delta m invariant is to use uh, the following uh, quantity, which is called the expected vanishing order. Um, the definition is as follows. You consider any birational model over X and you take any prime divisor. Then you can consider that this sequence of vector spaces. Okay, basically this space is, uh, you can think of this as a subspace of your linear system, which uh, consists of elements that have vanishing order at least J along F. So it's a subspace of your linear system and you sum up the dimension of all such spaces, then you take a suitable normalize. This is called the M expected vanishing order of uh, your line bundle along F. Now one has a very uh, important linear algebra lemma, which is simple, but uh, quite uh, useful. Uh, this is due to Fujita and Odaka. It, it says that uh, this quantity is equal to the soup of all the order of vanishing along F for all these basis divisors. Um, and uh, indeed, this soup can be achieved by some special divisor, which arises from a basis that is compatible with the following filtration. So, so when, you have a, when you have a divisor over your variety, you can consider the following filtration for your linear system. And uh, then using such filtration, you can choose a basis that is adapted to this sequence of subspaces, then, then you can easily check that uh, uh, the basis divisor constructed by such a basis uh, automat automatically has a vanishing order along F of uh, this form. Okay, so 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 this quantity is uh, uh, like the soup of vanishing order. So then you use the evaluative criterion for the LCD. You can you can show that this delta invariant, delta m invariant, is equal to the inf of uh, this quantity. The log discrepancy of this m expected vanishing order. Then you uh, let m go to infinity. Uh, and uh, the limit of uh, this quantity has a very interesting form, which is the integral of some volume function. Um, here, let me explain the volume of a line bundle. Uh, you can think of this as some growth condition for the holomorphic sections of this line bundle when, when you multiple, when, when you take the sufficiently large multiple. And uh, this quantity basically, like uh, uh, in terms of con convex geometry, you can think of the volume of the line bundle using convex bodies. And then this, uh, this volume function is basically like slicing this convex body and you um, consider the sliced convex body its volume. Then you integrate this slice the volume using this formula. Uh, so, so, so this quantity has some very beautiful uh, geometric interpretation. And this is again called uh, the expected vanishing order of your line bundle along F. And uh, here the, the, the convex body I mentioned earlier is called newton Oconco body. And using this uh, uh, theory, Bloom Johnson further show that the limits of uh, delta m exist and is equal to this evaluative quantity. Okay, so again, this formulation is very useful when you try to use directional tools to study this uh, invariant. So, so now here comes the question: Why do we need uh, such a quantity? Uh, this was answered by the following result. It's a result due to many people, but here sorry, I, I only list a few of them. It's uh, by the work of Fujita, Lee, and Boom Johnson, etc. such that uh, the following assertion holds. If uh, delta invariant is strictly bigger than one, 
then X is uniform and k-stable. So this can be used to test the uh, k-stability of your final manifold. Uh, I didn't define this uh, notion in this talk, but you can take this as a definition. Um, uh, you, you can think of this as uh, some sort of equivalent notion for the k Einstein property. Um, and also when delta, uh, and also delta greater or equal to one is equivalent to this uh, case semi stability. So, which means that this, uh, mm, uh, your manifold does not uh, pro possibly admit a Kalinstein metric, but it is in some sense close to a Kalinstein manifold or variety. Okay, so in, for this reason, this delta invariant is called uh, the stability threshold. So, so one can try to use this environment to uh, cook up or to find more examples of Kalinstein manifolds. And uh, there are a lot of progress going on here. But uh, I will talk about something else, which is called uh, the greatest reach lower bound, because this is also closely related to this delta environment. Uh, because in the previous uh, theorem, uh, we only focus on the case whether delta is bigger to one or not, but it did, it doesn't say anything about the case when delta is smaller than one. So when delta is smaller than one, we have uh, the following characterization, which uses the greatest stretch lower bound. And this is an analytic quantity, first uh, implicitly studied by Tian in 1993, which says that uh, it measures how positive the Ricci curvature can be for metrics in the first chunk class of your manifold. And uh, this is, of course, an analytic and a geometric quantity. And uh, the following result says that uh, this quantity is, can be characterized using this delta event. This result is due to Berman books on Johnson. And also, I gave an independent proof in my thesis. Uh, this result is, uh, in some sense, you can think of this as uh, Yautian Thompson theorem for twisted Kleinstein metrics. Um, basically, it answers the, the previous question on whether, on what happens when delta is smaller than one. Uh, there are also some interesting progress in this uh, direction given by Bloom, Liu, Zhou, which shows that. Uh, uh, when you have a n not stable uh, final variety, you can somehow degenerate your final variety along some continuity method, which will converge to some uh, limit Q final variety that has, uh, you can say, exactly achieves this uh, 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 delta environment. So, 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 in some sense, delta invariant can be uh, related to this continuity method that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, now, there is another application of this delta invariant. Uh, in 2015, Fujita proved a very beautiful result, which says that when the final manifold admits a Kalinstein metric, then the anti-canonical degree cannot be bigger than m plus one to the n. And the, the equality holds if and only if x is biholomorphic to uh, the CPN. And uh, actually he proves more. He actually shows that when x is, uh, uh, I guess, k semi-stable q final, then this also holds. But uh, ge geometrically, when um, one can base this uh, result because it's more related to the volume comparison in um, classical Riemannian geometry. So this result is saying that when you have a Kähler Einstein condition for a Kähler manifold, then the volume of a Kähler manifold cannot be bigger than the volume of uh, the uh, projective space. Um, based on this uh, result, I did some uh, extension I remove this um, Kalinstein equation 
I just uh, need this uh, lower bound of the rigid curvature, and also I don't need this omega to be uh, lie to to lie in any cohomology class of line bundles. This omega can be any transcendental uh, Kähler class. And then uh, the same result holds as well. The volume of uh, your manifold cannot be bigger than the volume of uh, the projected space. Uh, and uh, and also when we can characterize the equality case. When the equality happens, X is biholomorphic to CPN and uh, omega is uh, after some uh, biholomorphic transformation equal to the Fubini student metric. Um, um, to prove this result, basically the idea is to use some approximation argument because uh, this, uh, it, it, uh, this the result is uh, well known for like like for for rational class if you apply Fujita's argument, but uh, for rational uh, for for irrational classes you have to do something more because uh, the equality case is uh, more uh, difficult to characterize. So we use um, the theory of Newton concave bodies, and uh, one, one, one one finds that when the equality case um, and this Newton conical body has to be of some special shape. It has to satisfy some Brown-Minkowski inequality in, in comics. Actually, in this case, in the equality case, the, the Brown-Minkowski inequality becomes an equality. Then you can characterize the equality case, uh, and uh, you can deduce from that that your manifold is isomorphic to CPN. So this is, again, in the proof, we use uh, the delta invariant uh, heavily. And uh, so, so this is another application of uh, delta invariant. Now, now here comes the question, why is, uh, sorry? Hello, uh, I have a question. So uh, what, what's, your, okay. what's your Newton, uh, what's the uh, class of your Newton or conical bodies so it's associated with some which which line bundle you, you are use used to this Newton conformity? Oh, oh here oh the the um, the theory of Newton or conical bodies does not necessarily require your class to be a line bundle. Actually, you can you can define the conical body for R line bundles as well. So in this case, um, when you have a manifold with positive Ricci curvature. This automatically implies your manifold is uh, final, which implies that any Taylor class can be uh, treated as an ample R line bundle. Then, for for ample R line bundle, you can define the Newton conical bodies. Yeah. Great. So you mean, I mean so you, any Taylor class will be an R, R line bundle in the final writings? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I don't know this guy. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a that's a key point. So, so what's the equality? Yeah. So your assumption rich curvature is uh, at at least n plus one times omega. So this equality, mm -hmm. uh, the difference is is a Kähler form, uh, serving positive. Or? Yeah, so you can think of this equation uh, inequality as some equation. You can you can think of this as a a twisted Klein-Einstein equation. So so the rich omega is n plus one times omega plus some positive, semi-positive form. So, ah. so this is like a, like a twisted Kalanstein equation. Then, then this twisted, uh, then the existence of such a twisted Kalanstein metric uh, shows that the delta invariant of this class has to have some lower bound. This ah, is the true. result. Yeah, this is the result of Berman book from Johnson. Then, then you can argue that the volume of this class cannot be big. So, mm. using some. Uh, but using can you, you weaken the assumption that uh, your difference is only pseudo effective, uh, some pseudo effective class? Um, are you, um, probably you are saying if. You, you're saying this holds in a current sense? Yes, yes, exactly. I wonder, well, ah. yeah, just as a naive question. Wonder. Yes, yes. In the current sense, 
you, you can prove something similar here because there uh, the, the 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 result of Berman Bookman Johnson also works for the current case for current twisted Einstein equation. They also have some characterization using delta invariant. Then mm -hmm. in that but in that case you you should use twisted delta invariant. You you should twist your delta invariant by some current and uh, but uh, still you can prove an inequality like this. Uh, using the techniques of Fujita, and uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I should also mention here there's another um, extension of this result by Yu Chen Liu. Uh, his result is uh, included in the appendix of uh, my paper, which says that. Under the same curvature condition, if the volume of your manifold is very close to the volume of uh, your projected space, then your manifold is also biholomorphic to CPN. This is like a stability result. So, so there is some sort of gap here uh, when 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 the volume is uh, uh, sufficiently close to CPN, then manifold has to be CPN. This is uh, very much like the stability result in Riemannian geometry. In Riemannian geometry, when you have positive Ricci curvature and your manifold, the volume of your manifold is very close to the sphere volume, then your manifold is uh, diffeomorphic to the sphere. That's a classical Riemannian result. But uh, in Taylor geometry, one has similar results. But the, the proof, interestingly, is quite different. Uh, our strategy is quite algebraic. This is an interesting point. It would it would be uh, interesting if, if one can find more out uh, more uh, classical proof for such results. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so the question is why is delta so useful? Um, it turns out that delta invariant is uh, closely related to Ding thing function. So basically, uh, the, the results I mentioned earlier somehow already used a lot of this fact. But uh, so now one has to uh, sit down and uh, write down the uh, definition so one can uh, further study such uh, quantity. Um, now, let's um, uh, record the definition of Ding functional. This is a very uh, classical quantity that was introduced by Wei Yue Ding. And uh, here we use this uh, Mang Zhangpai energy, which is, is defined in this way. And then Professor Ding introduced uh, a sequence, a family of uh, functionals uh, in his paper. Here, here we choose some parameter delta in zero to one, and you can consider such quantities. And uh, you, you can calculate the critical point of this functional, which uh, will satisfy this uh, twisted Kalinstein equation. So when delta changes, you can think of this as the uh, continuity method I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, now, now the thing you do is that, uh, okay, so from this, basically you can observe that this thing functional has to have some relation with this delta event, right? So the, then basically what you do is just you, you rewrite this uh, thing functional in the following way. You introduce the following uh, threshold, uh, which is uh, some optimal exponent in the modal Schrodinger inequality. And uh, you just consider such, uh, again, this definition is very uh, uh, similar to Tian's definition for alpha invariant. The difference here is that this uh, soup phi is replaced by the Mang Zhangpai energy. You can observe that this is just a reformulation of a uh, thing functional, but uh, uh, if you write things in this way, you, you can try to relate uh, this with the classical story of alpha invariant. And uh, now, if you use the variational argument for this thing functional, one can show that the greatest reach lower bound is equal to the minimum of delta A and one. So if you recall the previous result on greatest reach lower bound, which says that beta is equal to minimum of 
algebra delta and one. Then you can take a guess, uh, which is the following conjecture. Uh, it is expected that this um, analytically defined delta invariant is equal to the algebraic delta invariant. But uh, so far, this is still open. Uh, uh, the thing is, when, when you look at this equality, it already tells you that when delta is smaller or equal to one, this is indeed true. But uh, it didn't say anything about what happens when delta is bigger than one. So you can, so you can guess this uh, is true or not. Uh, I mean, uh, one may say that this is a bit ambitious, but uh, I don't, I don't know. If one can come up with a counter example, that that then this would also also be very interesting. But anyway, let's let's try to guess that this holds, and. Uh, now we, we want to study this problem. There, there might be several ways to study this. Uh, one can use non-comedian approach or uh, other tools. So the, the, the approach I'm going to show next is the quantization approach. Okay. So to set up this quantization approach, when we recall, we recall this uh, Bergman space, because that any function, any Bergman potential is of this form, then you can consider the following log determinant function, which was originally introduced by Donaldson in his study of uh, CSCK problem. And uh, this uh, quantity is quite useful for us because as shown by Donaldson, when beta, uh, when, when m goes to infinity, this quantized uh, quantity will converge to the Mangja Empire energy. So this is like a quantized margin per energy. And using this, you can define this uh, quantized Ding functional. So again, uh, in the original definition of Ding functional, we just replace this margin per energy by this quantized uh, version. And uh, then this functional is defined on the Bergman space. So a key point here is that this Bergman space is finite dimensional. Uh, so basically we, uh, study uh, in the Kleinstein problem, we are doing analysis in a finite, infinite dimensional space, but uh, um, the quantization approach just says that we can use a finite dimensional object to approximate this infinite dimensional thing. Okay, so now when you have such a quantized functional, you can compute its critical point. Uh, you do the calculation and you show, uh, and, and you see that uh, this, if phi is a critical point, then it has to satisfy this equation. Um, you may say this equation looks a bit strange, but if you stare it at, stare it for several minutes, you will find that this is, uh, in some sense, uh, a fixed point of some mass because this Bergman potential is itself given by some basis. And now if you use this Bergman potential and you cook up this uh, L2 Hermitian product, then this is saying that this, the orthonormal basis of this L2 Hermitian inner product gives phi itself. So this is some, uh, you can say it's a fixed point of some mass. So in this sense, we call this critical point delta balance. We, we put a delta here because we have a parameter here. But so now here in this definition, one can make delta to be bigger than one. Why not? Because, because, the, um, because there is no restriction on delta if you just consider this uh, conceptually. Um, now, the thing is when, when m go to infinity, uh, you can show that if the limit of, if you have such a sequence of balance metrics and you take the limit, suppose that the, the limit exists and uh, then you can uh, calculate the limit will satisfy this uh, uh, twisted equation. So you can say that this uh, balanced equation is some kind of quantization of this twist Kelly-Einstein equation. Okay, well, uh, a special case is when delta is equal to one. In this case, uh, this balance metric is called anti-canonically balanced. This uh, is more classical because 
uh, in the literature, many people have studied this uh, uh, quantized uh, this balance metric. But uh, when when you have this uh, parameter delta, um, this I, I think it's more useful if you want to relate this to the delta invariant. Okay, so so now when so we have this, and uh, then you can define the following uh, quantized uh, delta uh, analytic delta invariant. Again, this definition is very similar to Tian's formulation of alpha m invariant. The difference is that this soup is replaced by quantized non-GM pair energy. And you cook up such an uh, invariant. And now it turns out that, uh, interestingly, this analytic quantity is exactly equal to the algebraic delta m invariant defined by Fujita and Ogak. Uh, so this result, uh, 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 in some sense, um, says that this algebraically defined delta invariant characterizes the coercivity of the quantized thing function. Because here you can observe that this formulation is just uh, a ref you are just rewriting your quantized thing functional to make uh, to convert to such an integral and basically this quantity is measuring the um, coercivity of your quantized thing functional. And uh, okay, so let me say a few words about the, the proof. Okay, the proof uh, follows from the same philosophy for the alpha invariant. Recall that I mentioned uh, similar results for alpha m invariant using the Maria and the Colas results. Now for delta m event, we uh, follow the similar approach, but uh, the, the proof is more complicated. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, when you consider delta event, uh, the choice of basis is very important. Uh, so here, if you apply the result of the Marian Kolar, we can reduce the consideration to all the orthonormal basis. Um, here, you just fix any uh, Hermitian inner product on the vector space, and then you consider all the orthonormal basis. Then the, the advantage of this consideration is that when you have a sequence of orthonormal basis, then you can extract a limit basis from this sequence. Okay, this is by some uh, trivial reason. Then, then this uh, consideration helps us to uh, establish one direction of this uh, uh, relation using some uh, uh, elementary inequality. Basically, you, you, you can uh, rewrite your analytic delta m invariant in some uh, diagonalized form. Then you can apply some inequality here. You can observe that this direction will follow. Now, the, the other direction will be more uh, uh, tricky. Uh, again, you, you need to find some, uh, um, you need to find some, uh, here we need to use the variation, variative uh, formulation for the delta m invariant. Recall that the delta m invariant can be characterized using divisors over your base manifold. So now suppose we have a divisor over divisor f over x, then this f will induce some uh, bergman jordesk array for your uh, for your variety. Basically, you just take the order of vanishing uh, of s i and you consider such a quantity. Here, this is in some sense a jordesk array in the bergman space, and you if you consider the your your uh, quantize the Ding energy along such geodesic array, you can try to to, to um, control its growth and you can try to analyze it um, uh, whether to see whether it has a lower bound or not. Then, then a key point is to prove the following uh, uniform integral estimate. So we, one can show that there is some quantity, some, some constant C does not depend uh, on, on your parameter t, such that as t goes to infinity, this quantity will have a definite lower bound. This will give you the other direction of, uh, of this uh, inequality. So, so 
when you combine these two, you can show that the analytic delta M is equal to the algebraic delta M. So this is uh, so this result is a quantized version of the conjecture I mentioned earlier. But uh, the thing is, when M go to goes to infinity, we don't know how to push this equality to the limits. It, it seems like there is more uh, deep work to be done to make the argument go through. But uh, anyway, so this is a quantized version. Then let me state several applications of this. Uh, first, uh, one, one can show that uh, this quantized yau tian donaldson result, which says that this delta M, the al algebraic delta M invariant is also a stability threshold for the existence of a anti-canonical balanced metric. And the result of the, is very similar to the classical statement for Kleinstein metrics. Basically, you replace the Kleinstein by, quant uh, by balanced and you re replace delta invariant by delta M invariant. So, oh, so sorry, there's a typo. So this is delta M bigger than one. Okay. So the proof of this just use uh, the variational argument for the quantized thin functional. And uh, we also need to apply the Burson convexity. And uh, it has more extensions. For instance, one can uh, work in the setting of uh, Berman, Bookson, Johnson. For instance, you, you can take any ample Q line bundle here. It doesn't have to be anti canonical. Then you have to make uh, things work consistently, you have to choose some uh, twist term. Uh, then here you can choose theta to be a KLT current. By KLT, I mean that uh, locally, if you write theta as DDC of some phi, then phi has to satisfy some, uh, uh, e, e, e to the minus phi has to satisfy some LP integrability condition. And in this condition, you can also define this uh, uh, del twisted delta M invariant and you can show that this twist, twisted delta M around characterize the existence of twisted balanced metric. And you can also try to extend in uh, by using some group action. For instance, we use the setup of Berman with Nistrum. You can consider the uh, G soliton case and uh, the following result can be thought of as a quantization of the recent result of Han and Lee, where they proved the Yau Tian Donaldson theorem for a very general class of metrics, which is called twisted G balanced metrics, I guess. So, so our result here is like a quantized version of their result, which says that uh, this uh, G weighted uh, theta twisted delta M variant can characterize the existence of uh, this twisted G-weighted balanced metric. Here, I didn't define the, these invariants, but you can imagine that they, their definition is quite similar. Basically, you change your uh, 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 when, you, when you define these invariants, you change your, you twist your uh, uh, line bundle by some current and uh, to and also you should twist your uh, log, log uh, discrepancy. You, you need to twist your uh, volume form. And also if you have some weight here, you need to put a weight in front of this uh, uh, Mount Jampier energy. So, so I, I will not give the definition here, but you can imagine what's going on here. And also another uh, extension is for coupled metrics. So you can consider several line bundles and uh, let's say you have a torus action on each line bundle and uh, you choose some uh, uh, smooth function on the moment polytope. Then you can again consider these uh, weighted delta M event for this coupled uh, line bundles. And you can also show that this delta invariant characterizes the existence of uh, coupled uh, balanced metrics. Uh, the reason why all such extensions 
go through is that all these metrics are, can be characterized by some sort of Ding functional. You can twist your Ding functional uh, because Ding functional has two parts. So in the first part, you can twist it by some current. In the second part, you can twist it by some, uh, some moment, uh, momentum quantity. Then um, if you consider this uh, coupled case, you can basically sum up all these uh, uh, different parts and you can cook up some coupled Ding functional. So the philosophy is that when, whenever you have a metric that is characterized by some Ding functional, then you can basically apply this quantization approach to show that uh, the quantized version of uh, Yautian Donaldson result. So, so all these results just show that this delta M invariant is um, closely related to the coercivity of Ding functional. But uh, now the remaining question is that when M goes to infinity, we don't know how to uh, show such a result. I mean, if uh, probably there will be some counter examples, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so this is uh, uh, the end of my talk and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Yeah. And now it's time for questions and remarks. And please unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Uh, yes, I have a question. Ah, sure. Uh, What's the relationship uh, uh, between your delta balance metric and uh, with, uh, the euro balance metric? Uh, um, you mean here, delta balance? Yeah, and yeah. Anti, anti canonical balance? No, no, delta balance and. Uh, oh, oh uh, you mean the, by the balance and. The oh, balance I, I, I see what you mean. You, yeah. The difference is here in the volume form here. Uh, when you define balance metrics, um, you can choose different volume here, volume forms here. Um, here in, in this definition, our volume form is chosen to be this one. But uh, in Donaldson's um, balance metrics, he chose, I guess, omega phi to the n, right? In that case, that's well, mm, uh, corresponds to the CSCK problem. But uh, here we choose a different volume form that depends on phi. This will correspond to the twisted kind of case. Basically, if you choose, the, the, the philosophy is like, you choose different volume forms, you will have different kinds of balance metrics. The, they will have different geometric meaning, I guess. But uh, this formulation, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's related to child stability. Uh, it has some relation, but uh, not uh, directly related. But uh, if you, uh, but in, in, in our work, we just show that you can use this delta M environment to, to characterize such balance metrics. So this is already some algebraic character, characterization for the existence of such metrics. If you use uh, if you use Donaldson's formulation, then you probably need to use child stability. That uh, will yeah. probably correspond to other uh, analytic or algebraic threshold. Uh, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Some other questions or remarks? All right, there seems to be no more. And so thank you very much for the talk. Thank and you, thank, thank you. you.